Okay, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our third session today. And today we're gonna to continue on with our uh, VQL fundamentals. Uh, just before we uh, start, let's, uh, let's kick off the server. Uh, and we're gonna do this the same every day. So um, the same as how we're doing it is, uh, every day is just, we're just using the Windows uh, binary with the GUI, you know, Velociraptor GUI. And, and this is just what we're gonna be doing for the rest of the day working locally on our, uh, our, our own system. So it's just gonna bring up the, um, the UI. Uh, and just before we start, there was a quick question here about um, how to use something that does not match. So we've, uh, we've explained uh, before. Uh, so let me just, uh, how am I gonna do this? Let me start just as a bit of a segue. I'll start another VQL query. Uh, so, for example, let's say that um, we already looked at the globe. We're going to look at globe a lot. Globes equals C users, uh, just as an example, right? So this is just going to show us all the directories in the in the users. And then the question was, uh, you, you, we know that we can restrict it with a regular expression. So we can say where... Uh, full path uh, matches, um, you know, Mike, for example. Uh, and then the question is, uh, how do I, how do I, you know, exclude that? So the opposite of match, and you just do a not, right? So we're not uh, full path matches, Mike, right? So that basically will invert the uh, the logic of the of the operation there. Uh, but it's not uh, so. You know, it's not, it's not a new operator, it's just an inverse. So, so it's not full match, not match, right? It's, it's uh, not full path matches, Mike. Okay, cool. Well, that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. So um, let's go back to our, um, our exercise. Before we finished yesterday, we were working on this uh, exercise to try and identify, to write a detection essentially from scratch try and identify a particular kind of, um, you know, a particular kind of a, a attack or lateral movement uh, that uh, basically uses WMI to create a command shell. Let me just uh, start that again so we can observe it. And you can see that when you run this, WMI uh, C process create uh, command to exit, it just, just creates a, um, a, a process using a WMI. And normally that would happen across the network. Uh, let me just go back to our, um, there it is. Okay, so this was our query. Just put it up it's at the top. Okay, this is our query. And you can see that uh, we used uh, Pierce list as the plugin. Uh, and then we, from, P, uh, from that, we extracted the name the PEDs, the parent PID, and then we did a subquery to resolve the uh, the name of the parent from its PID, right? So there's the uh, process ID of the parent, and then you know we just look it up and and uh, print the name of the parent. So that's the parent name, and uh, and then we have the command line and so forth, uh, and then we figured out that when we actually uh, launch the command in this way, then the parent of the command is a WMI process server because it makes a WMI call. And so we might say, okay, you know, that, that is a pretty reasonable detection. Uh, if we, you know, just look for uh, an executable that matches command.exe and the parent name is WMI, you know, PRVSE, then you know, that is suspicious, right? Because someone's used WMR to launch this command shell. So this is fine. And so far uh, we've, uh, we've done this on the endpoint, on, on the server, right? Because we are writing it in the VQL, uh, the VQL in the notebook. So it's just running locally on our server. But really what we want to do is we want to run it everywhere. We want to hunt for that. So in order to do that, we need to write an artifact. So an artifact is a, a way of us 
uh, essentially encapsulating this query inside something that can be reusable. So like a YAML file uh, that can be reusable. So uh, let me show you what the artifact, and I think we actually rushed through that part in the first session. Um, uh, we kind of skipped it. So I'm going to do it now. I'm going to introduce artifacts. I just mentioned it last time, uh, but this is the artifact view, the view artifacts screen, right? And this is every, this screen is basically everything to do with managing the artifact repository on the endpoint, on the, on the server. Uh, so uh, each Velociraptor server comes with a bunch of artifacts, as you can see here, and you can search for them as well. So for example, uh, let's say anything to do with processes, right? We've got a whole bunch of different ones. You know, this one, uh, for example, process memory, we're going to scan process memory uh, with the Yara rule, right? So we're going to scan it. And then, you know, if we, if we hit, we're going to um, grab process memory. So that's a pretty common, uh, common use case. Uh, or, you know, this one looks for PS exec uh, and actually kills it. If it detects PS exec running, um, you know, this one is uh, looking for process creation lo uh, uh, logs or process execution logs and so forth, right? So each of these is an artifact. And if you click on those, then you will see that they have uh, a bit of a description here. And then there's a, th a thing called the source, which is the, the source code of the artifact with the VQL essentially. And, uh, and then we can see this is the VQL, right? So, so this is, uh, you know, and we're, and we're going to learn about how exactly to write these things, but, you know, just so that you can see what, what it is, right? So here, here for example, is a subquery, right? That we, we talked about. Now in here, we are, actually looking at the artifacts that Velociraptor comes with it. So it, it comes with a whole bunch of built-in artifacts. So the, currently this is about uh, two to 50, 250, something like that, 250 artifacts that it's built in with, and you, know, and you can load more, uh, more artifacts. But the artifacts themselves are just YAML files. So there's nothing really that special about them. And you can actually see the YAML file if you just select any of these artifacts. Then you click the little pen, uh, pencil, I guess, over here, uh, and it will bring up an editor to show you uh, the artifact and allow you to go ahead and, uh, and actually customize it. So you can customize these artifacts by just modifying, the, it's just a YAML file. Um, and you can see over here, the name of it, there is a name, each artifact has a name. And when you uh, update it through the UI, uh, you know, we, we try to make sure that you don't overwrite uh, or kind of, you know, destroy like uh, built-in artifacts. So it always adds a name custom to the artifact. And uh, in fact, if I didn't have that, if I, so it adds it for you, but if you remove it, then it will refuse to save it, right? And you can click save. Then it will say, uh, you know, you, you have to have the word custom. Uh, in, in the artifact, right? So, um, so this is just a way of making sure that, you know, we don't override the artifact. But really there's internally, there's no real difference between uh, custom artifacts and built-in artifacts. They're the same thing. They can do the same thing and work the same way. So um, that's really all it is. Let's have a look at, um, if I'm going to write a new artifact, so from scratch, I'm gonna, uh, I could press the plus button here and that creates uh, a new artifact. So it starts off with a bit of a template to sort of make it a little bit easier for us to, uh, to, to fill in the, the blanks kind of thing. And these are, these are not all the things that you can write in an artifact, they're just the most common things. So most of the time that's, that's what you'll need. Um, and you know, the rest of the course, we're gonna be doing a lot of these things. We're gonna write a lot of artifacts. So uh, the, the first thing that you've got to write about an artifact is the name. So that's the name of the artifact. And that is how you choose it and select it and, and search for it, you know, that sort of thing. You can also put in a description, which is a human, uh, you know, readable description. This is where you can put, you know, um, some keywords to search for it. So um, when you search for the artifact, uh, in all the search screens, then it uh, searches, you know, like, like here, it searches the name and the description. So 
that just makes it more discoverable. So you can find out, um, I can find it a little bit easier. Uh, then we have the type of the artifact. And these are the different, uh, um, this is basically just controls the way the UI presents those artifacts and where they're, where these artifacts make sense to run. It's just, um, it's just a recommendation because the VQL, it doesn't really um, have any like limitations on the VQLs. The, the query itself is the same but it's just where it's going to run. So it gives you like a hint, a hint for the user about where, where they're supposed to run it. So if I'm going to write an artifact that is designed to run on the endpoint to collect information from the endpoint, then it would be a client artifact. Um, a server artifact is actually running on the server. So this one is usually used for administration or to do some post-processing or something like that. Um, client event artifact we're going to talk about that later today uh, and that that is a monitoring type artifact that can monitor uh, the endpoint and then we have a server event which is the same thing monitoring the server uh, we'll talk about that as well then artifacts have parameters um, which we didn't really we didn't really um, talk about that in the first uh, session so we can go back to um, to talk about it uh, but the idea here is that you can present, you can tweak the query a little bit. So instead of having, uh, so it's kind of like you can make a query, a VQL query that's very flexible, that's a little bit more flexible than just you know hard coded, um, and then uh, and then users can just tweak it, you know, give it some parameters and control the way that it runs. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit easier to um, you know to 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 tailor the artifact um, to to the case. Um, and then uh, we have this thing called the sources. So again, that's where the, the VQL source goes. There is a thing called a precondition. A precondition is basically a query. It's, it's another VQL query that will run. And if the query um, you know, doesn't return any rows, so it's, you know, we consider that it's false. And so in that case, we just skip the query. We just don't run it, right? But if we... Uh, if the precondition returns any any rows, so it's it's true, then we we execute the query. So the reason for that is that you can you can write an artifact and then you can safely run that artifact everywhere, and you know and it, if it's um you know if it's not supposed to run, then nothing will happen, right? So it's kind of a, it's a safety mechanism. So you know like if I'm writing an artifact for Windows and I accidentally launched against Linux or Darwin then nothing will happen, right? It will just, okay, I'm just going to leave it like, if I make the precondition like that, then it's not going to match, it returns false. And I mean, it's, it will still, you know, evaluate the query, but it's actually going to take no time at all to just not do anything, right? So, so it's just a safety mechanism. So that's the precondition. And then over here, we put the query. So that, that, um, vertical bar here, the pipe character, that's a YAML thing. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a YAML way of just kind of like um, keeping the, you know, indents correct and stuff like that. So we pretty much always have that there. Um, yeah, so there's a question. Uh, type does not influence the VQL at all. So is it just informational similar to a field in the meta section of the Yara rule? Yes, uh, sort of. So it, it doesn't really affect the way, the type here doesn't affect the way the VQL uh, runs. Uh, but what it does do is it, it, um, it, it affects the way you can search for it. So if I say, for example, had a type of client, that means that when I go over here, you know, and I find my client and then I click collect it and I click plus here, you know, that's where I'm going to find it, right? It's just searching for those ones. So for example, I'm not going to be able to see server artifacts because it doesn't make sense to run those on the client right so it's um so it's informational but it's more a ui thing as well right uh but of course you know using the api you can do whatever you want so you can you can launch a server one on the client or a client one on the server you, you can do whatever you want right but uh but it's just for the ui to just make things a little bit less confusing as you can imagine you know if if uh if over here i had server uh, artifacts and people would accidentally run it and it, it won't work right it basically doesn't make sense to run like a server artifact on on the endpoint uh yeah 
So, um, okay, so, cool. So, um, uh, so that's an artifact. So what we're gonna do now for this next exercise is we've got a query over here. That's our query. Uh, and we wanna convert that into uh, an artifact. Um, so um, uh, can you create a new types? Uh, there's a question, can you create a new type? So a new type of artifact? Uh, no, because the artifact, the type is just, you know, what the UI is going to do with it, right? So um, it's just, so the, the, it doesn't, you wouldn't really need to create a new type. Uh, you know, it's just for the UI. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's, let's, uh, let's look at how do we encode this query in an artifact. So what we would do is we'd first go over here to the artifact, uh, view artifact screen, right? And then we would create a new artifact, just like I showed you. So here we have the template. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a name. So this one is going to be, you know, windows dot, um, let's call it uh, WMI um, uh, dot parent process, like that. I don't know, something like that, right? And then I give it a description, uh, detect, detect processes launched from WMI, right? Like something like that, right? So now I can find it uh, and search for it. Um, oh, so there's a question. When you say the server, do you mean Velociraptor server? Yeah, I, I mean, there's Velociraptor server, not, not server on the network. Cause yeah, if you have a server on a network, it's still a client to Velociraptor, but yeah. When I say the server, I mean Velociraptor server. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So if you if you take it out completely, the default is client, right? So that's the default. If it's you know if it's empty, so you can you can just remove that. And we want it to be on client because we are going to collect it from clients. So that's what we want to do, right? I'm going to leave this. I'm just going to skip this this one for a minute, and go over here. Uh, I want it to run on Windows, and so I just do that. That's great. So that's that that does that, and then uh, and then you see I have you know my hello world query over here, um, so you know I'm just going to remove that because this is just like a placeholder, right? Then I'm going to go over to this tab over here. And I'm going to copy this query, so I'm just going to go copy and uh, over here, you know, paste. And, and then because it's a YAML thing, you know, it has to kind of be indented over. So I'm going to highlight it and press tab twice. And it becomes, you know, yellow. So that means that, you know, it's kind of indented correctly. So, uh, so there's my query, and um, that looks about right, right? So I'm I'm pretty happy with that. But what I would do now is think about how would someone use this, right? Like when they, I mean, I'm, I'm in my example, I'm looking for cmd.exe, right? But maybe, maybe the attacker is going to run PowerShell, or maybe they're going to run another program. And I want my users to be able to, um, to tweak that a little bit, right? So it's not hard coded. So in that case, what I actually want is I, I don't want to hard code this, you know, cmd.exe. I want to, I want to have some, uh, some flexibility in this, in this uh, artifact. And this is the point where I actually can think about adding parameters. So let me just, uh, so I'm going to add a parameter to control this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, it's going to be, well, give it a name. So the name is going to be uh, process regex, right? Because it's just the regular expression uh, for a uh, uh, process. I have another question. Does the query need to start with a pipe? Yep. So I mentioned that before. Uh, and the pipe here, the pipe character here, is a YAML thing, right? It's it's uh, the YAML format uses that to denote, um, you know, uh, as, as block block of text with um, uh, line feeds, a multi-line block of text. It's unfortunate because YAML YAML kind of is not not the easiest format to use. This is I would have if I had to do it, I, I would have chosen that format to be the default because that's probably what you always want. If you don't have that pipe, it still works, but it just messes up your indentation of, you know, when you look at it. So yeah, it's recommended to almost always to use that pipe character there. Um, yeah, it's just a YAML thing. So 
Uh, so here we have a name of, a, of the pr uh, parameter and uh, all parameters have a default. So we can give them a default, right? And, you know, we're, we're just going to do cmd.exe. So that will be the default, right? So when someone doesn't uh, want to tweak it or doesn't want to do anything with it, they just hit the button. It should have, you know, in most cases, you should try and make it relatively sensible like the defaults. And then uh, over here, we're just going to call it process regex, right? So, so what happens is the way that this works is that when I'm launching the artifact on the endpoint, uh, Velociraptor will uh, ask the user to fill in these parameters, uh, and then and then they'll it will send these parameters, and it's actually going to send them in the environment, right? So when the query starts running, those parameters become part of the scope as we uh, explained before. And so you can just refer to them by name and then they'll just be available, right? So, um, so that's, that's how it works. And that's really all it is. You press save and it saves it. Now, if there was a syntax error or if there was some problem with the query, then it will tell you about it. So let me just show you a syntax error. Like, so let's say that, uh, you know, I forgot this, you know, from, for example, like I just made a, a mistake uh, and it will tell you Oops, uh, that the VQL is not right, right? So it will stop you from messing it up. I mean, it doesn't, it's not foolproof. Like if you can still write uh, VQL, it you know, doesn't make sense. But uh, if you have a simple typo, uh, and especially with YAML, you have, you know, you could do like this kind of thing and that breaks the YAML, so it's wrong. And, uh, and it tells you, you know, line 15, it's broken. And it's, the line numbers are not always the best. So, you know, yeah, so, that's the um, that's how we create it. All right, so so now here's our parent process. That's great. Now we're going to launch it as an artifact. So we're going to go over here, collected, and uh, let me just um, oops close our guy and do it again. Yep. So now I have something to hunt for. That's great. And I'm going to press plus. Okay, and uh, so I can actually either search for it, you know, I can look up, look it up by WMI. And as I mentioned, it's the description that's searched for. So if you put keywords in the description, it's easier to find stuff. Um, and then, you know, I select this. Uh, so this is like a highlight, unhighlight. You know, if you unhighlight it, it unselects it. So make sure it's highlighted. So it's selected. Uh, and then you basically work your way down here in order. It's like a wizard, right? So you go like from left to right. And then um, the next thing, configure parameters. So you can look at that. Uh, and over here, so you can actually se select a number of different artifacts here. I can select a whole bunch, right? Um, but in this case, we usually I just do one, but you can do a lot uh, at the same time. Uh, and then when I, I can open it, I can actually also cancel by deleting this, but I can open it and that allows me to tweak the parameters. And as I said, it's usual, it's usual that um, you, you can have like normal, you know, normal, uh, you can use the dot as well as, as the wildcard, like, you know, as a regular expression of dot just matches anything. So, so you can just, you know, use a dot um, as well. That's, that works. So when we do this, we just uh, click, I'll, I'll talk about resources later, but we, we can just click launch and, uh, and it just comes back straight away with our, you know, uh, results. So, because this one's a very quick one. Oop. Yeah, so you can see that, oh, obviously system is not great because everybody's a parent of system. Okay, that wasn't, yeah. So you, you can refine the artifact and so on, right? But we found, we found our little command prompt here. So this is the one, the cmd.exe, uh, right? So, okay, cool. Now, so, so that's how we create an artifact, right? Uh, and then we can hunt for it and, and everything like that. Now, it might seem that uh, someone asked me that the other day is, how do I create a Windows artifact on Linux? Because it's, uh, how do I actually write the VQL? And that's why I'm showing you guys that you can run uh, Velociraptor GUI on Windows because you need to actually be able to do it on Windows, right? Otherwise, it just takes too long to figure out uh, how to write the artifact. 
uh, yeah, could you slow down and show how to load the artifact again? Yep. So um, once once we write it, yeah. So let's uh, let's do that again. So we write it from the ed editor. Right? Um, so it's this one. And all you have to do is uh, so now that I've written it, I can edit it as well and modify it and and look around and stuff like this. Uh, and then once I'm happy with it, I just save it. And it will just then appear in the search the search window, right? So then I can search for it. And um, and then to collect that artifact, it's the same thing as collecting all the other artifacts. You select your client, you point at your client, you click the collected artifacts, or you can go to this screen here. Um, and then you just add a new collection like this. Then you just select it. You know, there it is. That's my custom one. And that highlights it. And when I select it, it basically just tells me. So it's it's the same thing that we wrote in the YAML file. This is where you put in an explanation for the analyst to find this artifact easier. Uh, and then I just go to the next step along the way, the configure parameters. And then here, I have all the parameters that I'm going to configure, but by default, uh, they are folded, right? So they are kind of uh, hidden. So I have to click on, on them, uh, either, either click the name here or the little, you know, spanner uh, to configure, configure the, uh, um, the parameters. And depending on the parameters that I specified in the YAML file, I can have different, different parameters here. And we'll see later on uh, that you can have different types as well. And you can have like, you know, timestamps and dates and, and, you know, things like that. Uh, but here is where I can tweak it. But by default, you know, you shouldn't need to, I mean, you should do it so that it's easy, easy to use, right? Um, and then all I do is I click launch and uh, off I go, right? And that's, that's all it is, right? Um, once I launch it against the endpoint, off it goes, right? Um, and then hunting is the same thing, right? It's it's the same thing we've uh, talked about that the other day. You set up your hunt, and then you select your artifact in the same way. And then, um, I mean, here you can you, you don't have to put a description in, but you you can put one in, and uh, you select your artifact in the same way. So this is the new artifact that we've created, the customized one, and then configure the parameters. Same thing, exactly, right? Uh, and then once we're do, doing that, we click launch and we're building a hunt, right? So now it's, again, it starts off in the posed state. So we click start and off we go. And it will schedule it instantly and, you know, and run it. I mean, we only have one client now, so it's not that great, but it's the same thing, right? So there's just the one client, but this is how you hunt for it. So, you know, if I wanted to do this hunt, say, you know, any, ev everywhere on my network, is there any, kind of uh, WMI spawned um, executables, then, then that's that's a detection, right? It's not the best detection in the world, you know, but uh, it's just just an exercise to, to prove the point, right? Um, so we went through the full process in this exercise, right? We, we went through, uh, played around, usually you have to find like a, you know, proof of concept or some kind of uh, exploit or something like that that you can use. Um, if you have something running, where do you stop it? Uh, stop the collection, are you saying? Or, um, uh, yeah, so if you have a collection, um, well, we can, we can talk about it now. Uh, some, some of the queries may take a very long time. Uh, we're going to talk about MFT a bit later on, but just to give you an example, this particular one collects the whole MFT. It's going to be pretty huge, right? So if I launch it, um, then you will see that, um, you know, it's going to go off and collect and you'll see a lot of rows coming back and it might take, you know, a few minutes to do that or maybe longer, you see. And, and at that point, uh, you might say, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. Uh, you can cancel a query, a query at any time. If you press that stop button, then it actively goes out to the client and cancels that straight away. So, um, so it stops. And you will see the, the the collection become like an exclamation point, and it will say cancelled, right? So this is a way of uh, if you have a query accidentally that takes 
too long or takes much longer than you think you know you should you can cancel it immediately right so yeah uh, same thing with the hunt if you have a hunt and you accidentally launch the hunt and suddenly you know all your endpoints are starting to do a lot of work and you know and you're like no 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 i didn't want that you can cancel it and we'll actually go out to the endpoints and stop stop the hunt so you don't it's not um yeah so it's it's you know it's um a little bit of safety there um another question is it possible to execute vql for a client in the notebook i've noticed it only returns for the host or the artifact already collected so when you're running something in the notebook then it's running on the server right so whatever the server can do you can do it i mean you can you can run any vql on the server and you can you know check for you know the mft on the server or whatever um oh you mean uh you mean hunting so you can set up you can use the notebook to set up hunts um so then the notebook runs anything here and i can show you for instance um there we go oh make another vql cell um so you can you can evaluate there so there's a whole bunch of plugins that are designed to work on the server that that work on the on the server and one of one of them is hunt 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 uh oh, sorry it's a it's a function right so hunt now hunt is a function and uh, as you can see it says uh launch artifact collection oh well actually it, it launches the hunt uh can you so yeah so you can set up a hunt in in here right so you just give it the artifacts you know this will be like your uh, generic client info for example uh and um then you can set up expiry and, and blah 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 all this kind of stuff uh and then spec is how you can pass parameters to it if you need it to uh, in this case we don't we don't really need to uh and because it's a function we just we don't really need to select from anything so we can just select it from scope uh, and then when we do that, then it creates a uh, oh description. Sorry, we need to do a description. Description equals a auto hunt and auto hunt. So it's a automatic hunt, and you can see that when you run it, it creates the hunt ID and and it goes. It's created a hunt, right? So you can actually go over to here, and you will see see the hunt right it, it created it so you can create it from the notebook automatically when you do it that way when you do it from the notebook it doesn't really create it in a post state it, you see um the and you, you you would have seen that when we created in the ui it creates it in the post state and it makes you press start and it has a dialogue box you know makes you think about what you're doing right um so we don't want you to you know suddenly you know uh, cause damage to the network when you're doing things from VQL, um, there is no safety, right? Because we assume you know what you're doing, right? So you you're just going to launch that hunt. It just it just goes, right? So um, yeah, so just be aware of that. Um, uh, so can we search against endpoint in our environment on the fly using the notebook instead of the host server? So so that's a good question. You can schedule collections and you can schedule hunts on the on so you can schedule a collection against a specific uh, endpoint or you can schedule a hunt across all the endpoints from from the server from the notebook uh, anything that you can do in the ui you can do in the notebook it's the same, it's it's just an automated way of doing the same thing you know um yeah so we will we will like um show you how i'll show you how to do that in in seven in module seven when we're doing more of the administrative type uh type things but uh, but by the way, there, there is actually a, a new feature over here. Uh, we talked about the shell. Uh, last time, remember, I showed you how we can run like PowerShell. There is also a VQL here. So uh, since recently, I think maybe like two or three versions ago, uh, you can actually run VQL from there. Uh, it's not really recommended. Uh, let me show you how, like, so if we can select the vql that we did before uh, so this one it's not really recommended so but you can just you know run ad hoc 
you know, VQL, so you, you can make that one bigger a little bit. Um, you know, you can, you can do that now. Uh, it's not super recommended. You, usually you'd like to, um, to create a uh, artifact and then launch it and then collect it. Um, and this way it's more, it's more ad hoc, right? So it's a little bit like we didn't create an artifact. We're just running any kind of query. It, it's, I mean, it still works, um, but it's, it's a little, I don't know. I don't know if I like it, but um, people wanted it. So, you know, so it's in here like that. Um, yeah, you'll see that what it does is it can actually launch, it launches an artifact that runs any like arbitrary VQL basically on the endpoint. And then it sends the query to it. So, yeah, so it's like, a, it's so it saves you a bit of a step. You know, I don't really like it because I like to use the artifact to be able to reuse it. So other people can run the same thing again. Um, can you get something similar for a Yara rule? Um, yeah, so for a Yara rule, um, you don't have to, to do anything special, right? Like the, the file finder, uh, finder, there it is, uh, Windows search file finder, you just, that's actually how it works, right? You just paste your Yara rule in here. So you just paste your Yara rule in here and then you find out what you're searching and you can also limit it by dates and times and stuff like this. And then you can upload the file if you want. Um, so, you know, like here, you can go like rule X, you know, strings, strings. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do exercises like that. Actually, uh, we'll do we'll do an exercise like that a bit later. But yeah, just you just type the thing in and uh, and off you go, right? So it's just uh, you can also just if you have a hit, you can just grab the file or just grab the hash or whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, so it is kind of a hook. That's how it works for Yarrow. So yeah, all right. Um, let me just go back on track. Okay, so we've done this exercise. And uh, yeah, so um, the point of this exercise was to show you the full cycle. And we're going to do that a number of times. So it's not just the first time, but this is, uh, this is kind of the process, right? Uh, right, develop the VQL uh, on the machine, the, on the target machine that you're trying to work on. So if you're, if you're working on a Windows machine, you should run it on Windows. And also try and find the POC that you can actually like you know, detect, right? So, you know, um, so you can, you can test it properly. And then uh, once you test it and you come up with a query that you're happy with, uh, and then you can copy that. And uh, usually, and the reason that we are copying it uh, is that, you know, we're, we're working on Windows to do this in the notebook, right? Just like we did here. And then ideally our server is going to be, you know, on, on Linux. So we would have to, you know, essentially like open another tab and then uh, go to our server. This would be our actual server. We go onto this screen here and then create the artifact there, right? So, so yeah, it's not, uh, not, not the, um, yeah. So, so that's the easiest way to do it. Um, okay, so uh, we have another exercise. So that's, that, that was an easy exercise. Let's do a, a bit of a more interesting exercise. And just to show you again how, uh, you know, now we're going to apply our VQL skills to, uh, to build a more interesting or more, um, you know, complicated um, uh, artifact. Hold on, there is a few questions. Let me just, before we start, let me just answer these questions. Uh, can you create conditional VQL if specific parameters are selected? Very good question. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, the, the parameters in the VQL, um, you know, you can use them inside the query. So you can do like things like if or conditions. We'll, we'll talk about that. So you can have an artifact that does different things. In fact, this is exactly, I've just shown you that uh, right here uh, with the uh, file finder. Um, a Windows file finder. That's exactly what it does, right? So we have buttons here that says, you know, do you want to upload the file? So then it does one thing based on that. Or if you want to calculate the hash, so it does something based on that. So you can basically control the way the artifact works using these parameters. Uh, another question, if artifact collection is halfway through and the client goes offline, will the artifacts be collected once the client comes back online or it won't? That's also an excellent question. So the way it works 
is that the client on the endpoint, it runs the query, right? Now, um, if the client is rebooted, so it, like it turns off, right? Well, then the process is, is the Velociraptor process, you know, it stops, you know, well, we, we're out of luck, right? We, we basically term it, you know, we, the, the query stopped. Um, but if the client goes offline, so for example, like the, let's say it goes to sleep, someone closes their laptop and, uh, and then they go to sleep and then they open it, their laptop, you know, maybe offline or something like this. Um, then the query continues to run and then the results are actually buffered uh, on the endpoint in a buffer file. And then when the client comes back online, it uh, syncs that buffer file to the server. So uh, to some extent, uh, the results can come in uh, even when it's offline and then it will sync it later. It's buffered on the, on the endpoint. But if the uh, process is terminated, then you know, we, don't, uh, we don't actually... Um, you know, restart it. Like essentially the query is lost. You have to reissue it, reissue it again. Um, another question, can you use uh, VQL to remove duplicate results or do things like unique and sort? Yeah, we're going to look at that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, unique and sort and all these sort of stuff, that's, that's uh, simply group by, uh, and we're going, to be, uh, we're going to talk about group by later on. So yeah, that's today. Uh, Okay, cool. So let me just um, uh, continue on with this next example. Great. So, um, so this example is a typical enrichment e example. Uh, and so what, what we want to do here, and this is really where the power of VQL is, because, you know, VQL is like a glue. We have all of these capabilities in the tool, and then uh, VQL is allowing you to glue those together and create a new, a new kind of capability uh, and enrich the data, get more data and, and that sort of stuff. So this is a typical use case to enrich Netstat. So uh, what we want to do here is we want to get extra information about listening processes. All right, so, so we're looking for listening processes. And, uh, and then for all the listening processes, we want to get the following information. Uh, the executable that's running, uh, you know, uh, that's running that process, uh, the user who launched it, the process, uh, all the DLLs that are linked on that process, um, uh, possibly a manufacturer, like, you know, is it made by Microsoft or something like that, uh, and maybe a compile time or, um, you know, so this is like a PE type header type stuff, right? So this, so the idea here in this exercise is that we're getting information from lots of different, you know, uh, places, lots of related things uh, about the same, you know, the same thing, right? So, so um, we're just putting them together. It's your typical enrichment type artifact. So let me just uh, jump straight into it. Uh, so I'm going to make a new cell like this and um, okay. And then I, I usually like to just make it like this a bit bigger. All right. So the first thing I'm going to need is the Netstat plugin, right? So uh, that tells me about listening processes. So I usually do select star from as the first thing, to, just because I don't know what columns it's giving me. So <clears throat> and then I look at my completion um, you know, information. And, uh, and it says Netstat, OK, collect network information. Uh, that sounds about right. Uh, okay, and then I press question mark. What does it uh, require? Um, so it doesn't really take any parameters, right? These are just different functions. And so there's no arguments. So, okay. So if it doesn't take parameters, what sort of information does it give me? So usually um, I can just run it like this, but usually I like to limit to limit it because you know there's a lot of rows. And I don't want it to take too long. So I'm just gonna take 50 rows for now. And this is what the Netstat plugin is giving me, right? So it's giving me a whole bunch of rows. Remember, plugins just return rows. And, uh, and uh, each of the rows has different columns. So uh, if I look at, if I press the little binoculars here, that shows me the, the row data. And sometimes that's a lot easier to see, to see what you're getting, right? Uh, and so you can see that each of those uh, things here, you can fold them, that's a row, right? And then, and then we have multiple of them. So, okay, so this is the information we get. <clears throat> so we get the family 
um, which is the you know the socket family, the type, the one, two, three. Um, <clears throat> so these are just the uh, so this is basically coming back from the API. So you can look up the API and say, what does that mean? You know, um, there's a listening address uh, which gives me the IP address. Oops, uh, and the port. Uh, and so, so sorry, that's the local address. That's the remote address. So if the socket is connected, that remote address would have an IP address. You know, you can see for some of them are established. If it's established, I actually have a local address connected to a remote address. So I have two ends, right? But if it's listening, then uh, usually I only have a local address. The remote address is zero, right? Because it's listening, right? So that makes sense. So over here, I've got the status is listening. And then I have a PID that tells me the process that's listening. So that's a PID. Then I have a timestamp. So I know when it started listening. So that's the timestamp when the socket was created. And, and then I have, uh, you know, whether it's an IP. So this string is sort of the same as this family, right? So, um, so it's just a string way of, of it. So. Okay, so let's have a look. So we in this one, we are supposed to really be looking at uh, listening. So we don't care about the established um, IP addresses with info. Uh, it's not possible. So the IP address, um, so uh, are you saying the IP address of the endpoint uh, or the IP address? So this is the IP address of the remote, uh, ad the remote address, right? So if it's talking, see if he, here it's established, so it's the IP address of the other end of the of the system, right? Um, okay. So um, <clears throat> in this case, we want to listen for we want to get the listening listening one. So first, of, straight away, I can just go where um, and then status. So that's the status status status, and I use my regular expression match uh, listen, right? Okay, so off we go. Uh, oops. Uh, so that's just going to filter out uh, just the listening addresses. Now, if I'm just looking at listening addresses, then uh, you know the remote address is always zero, right? By definition, so I don't care about it. I only care about the local address. You can see that the local address is like a uh, it's like a dictionary. Um, it has a local interface, the IP, and it has a port. Um, <clears throat> so the, the next thing that I always do is just remove the columns that I don't care about because I just want to tidy it up a little bit so it's not so cluttered. So uh, over here from these columns, the only thing I care about is local address, so local address. Uh, and then I, I'm going to care about, so the status is, they're all going to be the same because I'm filtering on it, so obviously. And then PID. That's I care about that. I'm going to need that, and maybe maybe the timestamp will be kind of cool to have. And then the other stuff is really not so important, right? So I don't care about it. So the next step, I'm just going to just clean it up a bit. Okay. Uh, there's a question. Oh yeah. So okay. Yep. Yeah, no worries. Uh, people are talking about Sysmon. We, we're going to talk about Sysmon a bit later as well. Okay. So so here is so that's the first step. Now I'm going to go back to my question and I'm going to need to know binary path on disk. So the binary path is like the thing that's running. It's the process that's running. So I need to find out um, the process that's running. But the only thing that I actually have is the process ID. I don't have anything else about it. So, but that's okay because I, I actually know how to do that. Uh, let me do a sub query to find out stuff about this this process uh, right so select stuff from and we've seen this before right we know that the ps list plugin tells us stuff about processes great so question mark you can see it takes a pid awesome uh, and then you know we're just going to pass the pid to it and let's just see all the stuff that it gives me uh, but let's just re reduce the number of rows because you know i'm not going to need most of this information. So that subquery is going to basically give me uh, the row, right? So this is the information that we've got, the PID, the PPID, and the name, and all this sort of stuff. So it depends on what information I actually want about this process. Um, but I need the binary path, right? So the binary path is 
you know, the executable, like that's where it is, right? So from here, um, I, I'm going to really just need the executable here, right? Um, I can get other stuff just, just because why not, right? Um, the, uh, oh, and I, I, I want to know the username that launched the binary as well. So that's, that's the second thing, right? And that I'm looking for. So that's this username here. So user name. Um, so essentially what I'm doing now is just in the subquery, I'm just uh, collecting, I'm just uh, getting those fields that I care about, right? I, I don't care about the other things. I can get the seed if I want it. Um, maybe the command line is useful. I don't know. So you basically just kind of choose what you want from here. Uh, command line, something like that, right? Um, and this is the creation time of the process. So uh, this is the time of the socket. This is the time of the process. Uh, okay, cool, yeah. Um, okay, so let's have a look, great. So now we can see that we've got some information here. Okay, excellent. What else do we need to know? Okay, we need to know the linked DLLs, right? So all the DLLs that are linked uh, to, to this process. Well, how do we do that? Uh, well, it turns out that there is actually a, um, uh, so let me just, before I do that, I'm just gonna rename that column because, you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit harder to see. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be process info. I'm just gonna call it that. Uh, and then I'm going to do another subquery to look for the link DLLs, right? Select star from, now modules, enumerate loaded DLLs, right? So it just shows me all the modules. So it's sort of similar to the volatility plugin uh, of the same name. So uh, what parameters does it take? It takes a PID, excellent. So I'm gonna provide the PID. Uh, and uh, we're just going to do five for now, just a little bit, because you know it's it's going to return a lot of DLLs. You see, there's there's tons and tons of DLLs. So what it's doing here is it's actually going to run this subquery here, uh, and you know essentially all the rows come back as as an array because it's a subquery. Um, and then uh, you you can see that we only really care about. So, you know, we've got, we actually get information about where the DLLs are mapped and stuff like this, but, you know, we don't care about it. Uh, really, all we care about is the executable path. We don't care about the rest. So we can just change that star to exe path like this. Okay. And so that just makes it a little bit easier. So you can see, okay, this is the list of all the DLLs, right? So let's say as linked DLLs, right? So that's this one. Uh, and what else do we need? Uh, manufacturer, if available, okay? So that's cool. So now we need to know information about the manufacturer of the binary. So the binary is on disk, okay? And there's metadata in this binary on disk uh, about the manufacturer, like, uh, you know, from, from the PE header of the binary. So let's try and parse the PE header and see what information we can get, you know, from the PE header. So uh, this is the executable. So all we do is we do another subquery. <laughs> We're gonna just like, uh, but uh, for for this one, uh, we just need to parse the uh, parse the PE oops PE header, which is actually a function. So it's not not a plugin. It's just a function because you know we just give it. So remember that a function is something that just takes a value and returns another value. And a plugin is something that returns lots and lots of rows or you know, one or more rows. But in this case, um, when you're parsing a PE file, it just tells you all the information about the PE file. So it's a function. So it takes these parameters, accessor and file. We'll talk about accessor tomorrow. So just ignore that for now. But the file name is going to be exe. Right, so it's the executable. That's the file name. Uh, and so let's uh, let's see what it uh, looks like a little bit. Uh, there is a question. Just a moment. Um, 
Question, as powerful as they are, why do we continue to add nested subqueries, even though we can get that filtering data from the where clause? Uh, so you can't really get data from the where clause. The where clause is only for, uh, it only can, it basically just returns true or false. So uh, you, 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 you don't have to do sub filtering, right? Like essentially um, in, this, in this case, there are, nest, there are sub queries. Uh, you can you can use these nested um, the stored queries that we mentioned you know the other day with the let you know like this but um, but I just wanted to show you how you build the query up um, could you use sub queries here I, I mean you could right you you can and I'll show you that later um, oh I can show you that now I guess oops so we can we can go let uh, so let's say we want to do this guy, uh, modules, no get modules. So this is, this is kind of like a store query, right? So then here you can just do get modules. So it's you you can do it like that and it may be a little bit easier um but you know it still does the same thing right but yeah i i don't know yeah i mean it, it when you have a lot of these nested queries this kind of uh thing is a little bit more readable so yeah so it would be good yeah to to do that but it's more complicated i didn't want to introduce yet another concept uh of of this so we'll start off with these nested queries and then we can refactor it to to these kind of to this kind of uh, thing. Um, <clears throat> is there a way we can delete history on shell commands? Uh, so delete history on shell commands. There shouldn't be any. You mean on PowerShell? Um, I don't know. I mean, you can you can I guess do anything. I guess um, you can run arbitrary PowerShell. Uh, but we don't do anything out of the ordinary to to delete anything. Um, if that's that's the question, so we we just if you're running power, uh, shell commands using the shell uh, feature, then it just runs uh, PowerShell with you know we just shell out to PowerShell. So if it stores history, then then that history will end up you know being stored there. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so you can do stuff like this for the modules. Um, I mean, it still works, but okay. <clears throat> I didn't want to confuse it too much. Let's let's look at our uh, process info now. So uh, the process info is this subquery here, and we just added the parse PE, um, and we're parsing these PE files. So the parse PE function, all it does is it takes a, a path to a PE file, and then it parses stuff out of it, right? So it tells us information like about the file header. You know, and this is the time date stamp, but it's not really a date stamp anymore. Uh, it's it's um, it's it's not used. It was at one point used as a date stamp, but it's not a date stamp now. Um, and then there is this GUID, and the GUID is actually pretty good because it tells you a little bit, you know, uh, about um, if they left if they left uh, debugging symbols in there, like PDB file then that GUID will be uh, a fairly unique identifier. So sometimes, you know, malware accidentally does that. Um, and then we've got the sections. So these are the different PE sections, you know, not so interesting. Uh, but the most interesting thing is this version information that comes out of the PE header. Um, so this is like a resource section and some manufacturers, not, not everyone, but a lot, most, most manufacturers, uh, actually fill this information in. It's not really the same as like a signed uh, thing, but it's it's not really signed, but it's um, uh, but it's there. So you know it can be used sometimes to identify Microsoft binaries. Um, so in this particular question, uh, and that's the imp hash here, uh, and then here we, we've got the import table over here, right, and then the export table over here. If there is one, if there is a DLL, it will have an export table. Um, but the import table is useful to be able to more or less fingerprint the binary, you know, um, and then the imp hash is useful as well. So this is this is useful for example to try and find uh, binaries that were renamed 
you know, um, for example, uh, if uh, attackers are using low beans, uh, living on the land binaries, and then they might rename them. So they're still signed and they'll still work. But, you know, a lot of the detections are, you know, uh, very simplistic and rely on file names and it will fail for that if you have very simple detection. So, so, so you know, you can use these kind of things to try and identify the, the binary. But in this, in this example, all we care about is this version information here. So let's, let's get that. So over here, we're just going to do the dot version information. And this is coming back to the question, remember, that we had yesterday, where if you've got, you know, a bit of a uh, structure, like, you know, a dictionary in here, how do you, how do you get, so this is the function call, how do you get one of the fields, uh, just the dot operator, right? So, yeah, so if we do that, then, um, then we end up with just this information, your company name, file descriptor, these kind of things. So uh, we can rename that to make it a little bit, you know, easier. Yep, a little bit easier to see. Um, and uh, and there we go, right? So so we've got a bunch of information here, we've got an exe version information, uh, username, command line, all this sort of stuff. So this is this is pretty good, um, you know. Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is pretty good, and uh, I think that's basically all the things that we are in the compile time. I guess uh, this is all the things we wanted to do in in this uh, exercise. Uh, is there a module to check whether a PE file is signed and the signature is valid? Yeah, of course. So uh, you can do that. I mean, we can extend it, of course. Um, there is a authentic code, function called authentic code. Authentic code is the signing mechanism in Windows. And it's just a function, you give it the file name and it tells you information about the file, you know, from, you know, whether it's authentic code signed or not. So I'll just show you that real quick. Uh, I mean, it's, oh, sorry, I have to put another comma here. Yeah. So it is, it's just calling the API. It's not really that, uh, that uh, much of a rocket science. It's just calling the authentic code API, which is also cool because it still tells us information about publisher link and more info. So this information is coming from the authentic code part of the PE header. And then finally, if it's trusted, right? So this is the API. So the API itself is going to compare the certificates and the signing and all this sort of stuff. It's um, it's it's good, but uh, be aware that if the attacker added uh, like their their self signed certificate to this to the root store, uh, then it might it might not uh, it might show that it's trusted, but you know it's it's not right. So uh, so it's not foolproof, right? Because it's done on the endpoint still. Um, how can we do? Uh, the, the, we asked that one already. Yeah, cool. All right, so um, cool, cool. So uh, yeah, so this is the net stat. So again, we're walk, walking through the process. We're just building it up, adding, uh, we, you know, we can format, you can format using uh, this way, you can format uh, things in a little bit more uh, better way. So for example, in here, uh, this kind of, this is kind of funny. It would be nicer to actually format it, you know, a little bit better uh, format using the format function, which takes a format string percent v percent v percent v is like the um, it's like in uh, Python's percent r I think percent s it's just a string um, uh, expansion, and then question mark args, so it takes these arguments in a list like this. L address dot IP comma L address dot port like this. So this is just a, a better way of formatting it sort of like, like this, 
right? So it's a little bit cleaner. Um, is PE info a shortcut for parse PE? Uh, no, uh, PE info. Uh, let me see. Are uh, you mean the plugin PE info? PE info. Or select star from PE. No, there's 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 uh, there's an artifact called PE info, but that's that's a little bit different. Um, you use PE info there instead of pass uh, from the slides. Ah, really? Uh, PE info. Oh, okay, no, no. So it's the name, right? That's the name that we use, right? So. What's happening here is that we we called pause PE. Uh, that's the function, right? And then uh, as we rename it uh, to a PE info. And then because PE info now is like a dict, right? Then we can uh, go and grab each field. So the, the reason that we're doing it is because we don't want to calculate it twice. So we want to calculate it one time. And then, uh, and then we're basically um referring to different you know members of that dict you know so yeah so it's not a function it's just a variable name that we're calling it or column name i guess yeah all right but a good question very well observed cool um all right so so yeah so you can sort of tweak it you can see that you can you know build it up tweak it control the you know the different um you know fields and so on so which is, you know, that's kind of the, the point. Once you are happy with it, then again, we're just going to create uh, another um, another uh, artifact. You just copy it all into an artifact and um, <clears throat> you can remove that limit and call the thing. So now it's gonna take a lot longer because it's gonna look at all the different uh, listening sockets. And then you also see that there are some, some uh, log messages so you'll see these these are the log messages that happen when you run the query uh, for example it can't open the dos header so what's happening here is that at some some processes because we're looking at the executable from the ps list and some of the processes like system they don't have uh, any executable defined right so there's no executable there so we're trying to open it and it doesn't exist so there's a few uh, like er errors here. Uh, this error mean that the handle is invalid. That means that we can't open a handle to that process. So th something like system PID4, uh, PID4 is the system process. You can't really open it. Um, and so for certain things like the modules uh, plugin, so uh, modules, we need to enumerate the DLLs, right? In order to do that, we have to open the handle to the process. And so some of them we can't. So LSAS, you know, is protected. So there's a whole bunch of processes that we can't really do that. So we all get these kind of errors in here. That's perfectly okay. You know, that's fine. Uh, but you see, uh, we've got the stats here. This is how long it took, what we did with it, you know. And then we've got the, um, the data. So we've got a ton of data. Um, this big list of data here is probably, I don't know how useful it is, but it really only took two seconds to run the thing. Right, so it, it's pretty quick. Uh, and then we've got all the additional information in here. So um, did we create an artifact? Yeah, so we could just create an artifact uh, from that. Um, I think we are fine, we'll just skip that. We, we understand how to do that. Just go through that, uh, creating the parameters and so on. Um, now, just going back to the artifacts, so with the parameters, uh, you can create as many parameters as you want. Uh, let me go to our artifacts that we customized before. So if you remember, uh, we built our, uh, this one, parent WMI processes. So you can add any number of parameters that you want. And uh, let me just show you, I mean, you don't even have to use them, right? So we're just gonna add a couple of uh, interesting ones. So uh, a lot of, times you want to have like a before and after date, something like that. And you can specify a type timestamp, right? 
So that is the type of this parameter. So when I do this, when I now go and try and collect it, okay, I'm gonna hit search, grab my artifact uh, from here, right? So this is the, the one uh, that we did. And because we added the new parameter, it shows up here. So now if I look at the, um, Yeah, if I look at the parameter, uh, then I have a time selector, right? Because I, this, I said it was a time stamp, right? So, so then uh, I can, you know, choose a date and time and that sort of stuff. Right? AM and, you know, this kind of clock, and stuff like this, you know, it's just a date selector. Now the date selector, can, I can do UTC or local. And that's important because every, um, every time stamp in Velociraptor is in UTC. It's always showing in UTC. So it has a Z at the end, uh, but sometimes it's easier to you know, work with local. So you can switch between one or the other here. And what that does is it creates a time stamp in the, in the VQL. Is there a list of VQL parameter types somewhere? Great question, uh, next slide. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there, All right? So over here there's, so this is the different parameter types that you can have. Um, but usually, like if you don't specify anything, it's a string by default. I, mean, I think you can also say string, but it, it's the default, so it does, doesn't matter. Uh, but you can specify an integer or an int. Um, then you can specify a timestamp, as I've just shown. And a CSV and JSON, we're going to talk about those, uh, why they're useful later. But it's basically a, a CSV formatted list of, um, of, of rows, like a table, basically. And then JSON, and uh, and then finally a bool. So when you have a bool, then you have like a checkbox, uh, true, false. We've seen that one before. Um, another question: If you would like to have a column for processing for command line, would Velociraptor run the query multiple times? Uh, no, it doesn't. So basically, what you do this is a very good question. Uh, this is not, so uh, this is a good question because a lot of the time we want to export this data to another system. And uh, a lot of systems, they need to have a flat structure, right? So this kind of structure where you have like a nesting, it's not very convenient for many systems because especially if you're going to put in, in something like an SQL database, then it needs to be flat. So you need to have all of these um, columns as separate columns. And so what ends up happening in these kind of things is that you need to kind of like, you know, kind of uh, tease out these, these, um, these, these things, right? So uh, what you need to do in order to do that is create uh, a stored query. So you, you make a stored query like this, let x equals that. And remember that stored queries are lazy, right? So they only run when they need to and they run in, in, in immediately, right? So, and then you can essentially select from that. But what we're gonna do, so, you know, for example, here as, um, I don't know, socket, whatever. And then you can just select uh, these things. And then when you come to, to, um, to this field, right? Then it will be process info. Now we're going to go deeper, right? Dot exe, that's this one, comma process info dot, and then version, version information has to be together. Dot, uh, let's say company name. So you are going into the, the data structure uh, and then that kind of flattens it out. So you have to like do this flattening thing, you know, um, and so on like that, right? And then from, you know, and, you know, obviously from X. Oops. So that is basically uh, free, right? So essentially what we'll do is it runs that query chains to that. And because it's a stored query, it just runs it. So uh, essentially remember how I mentioned yesterday that what you need to do is visualize how the rows work, right? How the rows are passing through the query. And the way that rows is passing, are passing is a row comes out of this, it gets filtered, you know, it goes into here and then it gets passed into there and 
that row comes out and then it comes out to X and then it comes into here and it goes to there, right? So, so it actually, that's how it's gonna work. Um, it, it's asynchronous, so it actually does it all at the same time, but it's very cheap, right? It doesn't take any more uh, time. And, and, you know, you can do it as like that, right? So, so that breaks it down into a, um, a more flatter structure. Uh, you know, so like this kind of, right? So, so that's, that's very common to do these kind of uh, flattenings. Cool. Uh, okay. How are we doing for time? Okay, cool. So we are okay. All right. So we can create an artifact from that, right? Um, we've talked about that. We did the WMI subprocess artifact. Um, and we talked about how we can change the constants that we use in the query, we can change that uh, to a parameter that makes the artifact much more useful. Um, and then uh, and then we can create a hunt and we did that. Um, and hunt for it everywhere and find you know, our malicious uh, hosts and detection. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of slides here about artifact writing tips. So you can do this, uh, this uh, let x equals and store these stored queries. Um, and that helps a little bit because uh, those are essentially like commenting, and commenting it out because it doesn't uh, really do anything with those. Um, if you recall, that stored query doesn't run anything. So in usually when you uh, work in the notebook, you can create multiple queries. And I think I show that yesterday when I created the PS list query and then I created the stat query as two separate tables and you know just kind of copy pasted some values from one to the other just to kind of understand what's uh, how they are supposed to go together. So it's like an intermediate you know practice. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> use the log function. So this is this is a really valuable um, uh, piece of advice here. When you are running, when you're writing your artifacts, it's it's difficult sometimes to know uh, what. Let me just create another uh, another thing. In order to debug what's going on, then it's it's better to use the log function. So here's an example of a very simple query. So uh, here we've got uh, PS list, right? So you know we'll start simple limit. 50, let's say. So uh, you can see that it's it's giving us a whole bunch of data here. And let's say that I had a query that said something like, um, you know, where, uh, I don't know, username, username matches Mike, right? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, or, or let's say, you know, I, I misspelled that, right? So it returns no rows, right? Because it it's misspelled. But if I didn't realize it and I'm like, okay, I don't understand why it's not returning any rows. What you can actually do is uh, you can actually print <clears throat> a lot of the information in a log in a log message. Uh, and, and we're using the same technique that we used yesterday, remember with our log exercise. So you can, you can use this log message equals, right? username and if we do that right then what will happen is remember that log function always returns true and then it will also print the name of uh, the message right and then the message is going to be the username so when we run this it will actually print all the usernames as as it's evaluating them row by row right and uh it's just like debugging so it's just like printing it but, but you, you can see that it's printing it even though the, the column is eliminated, right? But we just don't know why it's eliminated, right? And so we can actually, um, so we can actually, uh, you can use format to, to write like a format string. You to write, it's, it's like a print debug, right? And then you can, you know, write like username, comma, I think it's seed, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and you know, oh, it's not seed. It's uh, anyway. I don't know name, whatever. Uh, and then you can see, you can see that. So it's uh, as it's uh, evaluating every each row, 
then it will print it and you can you know see how it's going as it's going along and um even though your queries you know filtering these things out so you can it's just a really good way of debugging debugging the the query as it goes along the other thing is using the other trick is using in this format using this percent capital t and the percent capital t um is actually um tells you the type of the of the item so in this case you know we can use uh, percent t and it will just say it's a string 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 right so if you're not sure what the type is then you use percent t to tell you uh so a timestamp epoch is uh time dot time right so this is the type of the of the the item <clears throat> so a lot of the time you end up with like time dot time you know for create time and so on right <clears throat> the other thing is that you can also call other artifacts from inside vql and this is really important because we can use that to build and uh, build a more modular set of artifacts so here's an example there is an artifact that collects uh that just lists all the system users you can see it in here if we look at it here search for users and down here it's actually a pretty complicated artifact it has a uh, it's not complicated but it has a lot of uh functionality because it actually if you look at it it uh it looks for local users by looking at the registry as well uh and then it also has uh the users plugin which uses the enum users uh, api and we're also reading registry keys and so on so we're we're actually looking at um you know evidence in the registry that the user logged on like for example a network uh, user with an interactive logon will create registry keys so we're looking for those um, as well as you know um, finding a local uh, sam accounts and you know uh, accounts from the sam and other things so <clears throat> so this is actually a lot of functionality but a lot of the time you know listing users is kind of a common thing to do right you you want to do that uh, fairly frequently well it turns out that you don't have to reinvent the wheel you can just call that artifact from within vql and the, the way that you do that is when you want to call another artifact you have to use this uh artifact keyword this artifact um it's actually a plugin so it's it's a plugin that launches artifacts as part of itself so it's capital a not all the other plugins are you know small case but this one is special and the way that you call the other artifact is using this dot so you go dot, and then you can see that it's it's telling you the next uh, next name of the artifact. So we're going to do Windows, and then you do a dot, uh, and then you know there's so it's basically building up the name, right? System uh, dot users. So it completes the um, the artifact names for you. Uh, but when you run that, then it's just the same as running uh, the actual artifact, as you can see. And so it's just telling us all the list of users, you know, like my SSH and so on. But the cool thing about it is that um, it looks to us like this artifacts is like it's just another plugin, right? So it looks like a plugin. So I can filter it. Uh, so I can go, you know, where uh, name matches Mike, right? And so that's that will filter only that. And so it will show me, you know, the seed and and uh, end time when when the user was logged log, last logged on and the type of user and these kind of things right so so um but this is true for every artifact so even the ones the custom ones that we've just written same thing right except that what we would need to do is start with custom because you know their name starts with custom and uh you know we had our wmi artifact uh parent process great let's see so uh, this is the one we created today. So we run it and the same thing happens, right? So it just runs the artifact uh, from another artifact. We can call one artifact using another artifact, right? <clears throat> um, so uh, if you if you go into the artifact, so this is the artifact we created before. And if we put a question mark in there, 
And if you rec recall the parameters that we added to the artifact in the definition, uh, when we call it like this, th those parameters are like, like arguments to the artifact, right? So just arguments. So we can use a process regex here. We can change it. Remember how it was uh, cmd.exe? We can do like PowerShell, right? Or, or whatever, like search for PowerShell. And uh, I mean, uh, we can do it here. Actually start a PowerShell script and you will be able to see PowerShell. Okay, so we're starting PowerShell. So we go over here, do a refresh and we'll see that. So you can see that the, uh, the parameters then become like parameters that you can call. So it's like when we're writing an artifact, we're actually writing a little function, a little module that we can call, you know, um, and build on that. So you can build on that, you can write artifacts, you can use other artifacts and modularize, modularize it like that. Okay, cool. So, so that is actually pretty uh, useful. Um, there's a couple of slides here about times. Um, so when we have times, we have uh, strong types. Uh, we talked about the, the percent T trick before. Uh, and then timestamps are given as time.time .time types. So you can actually do some fancy stuff with it. Like you can call, uh, this is the link to the Go, the Golang. Um, so it's a, it's a Go um, type, time.time. Uh, time so all of these functions are available in VQL as well. <clears throat> so, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, getting the, um, the minutes, the seconds, these kind of things, right? So you can do these kind of formatting. I think we have an example here of uh, formatting. I think it's the next one. Yeah, format the time in a particular way. So you can actually use the, um, you can do it like this, right? Because the time, uh, the timestamp <clears throat> has a day, a month, a year, hour, minute, second uh, methods. So you can call them and format it. So yeah, so times are useful. So you can convert from uh, strings to times and then uh, back again. The, there is a, uh, So there is a timestamp um, function that takes an epoch time, or it also can take a, a Microsoft Win file time or a string time or whatever. So it converts into times from all kinds of types. Um, we have a question. Can you hunt the embedded executable file that's injected to the legit file, uh, like in Office files? So um, it depends what you mean. So we can do things like um, OLE. We can, there is an OLE uh, parser that you can use to unpack, uh, you know, the OLE VBA type, type stuff. Uh, we can unpack things like zip files and, and so on. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that we can, uh, it depends really on what, what kind of embedded file um, it is. Okay, cool. So, but we can, we can usually like do a Yara sig and then if we find it, we can fetch that file for post-processing. So we, we don't want to try and have uh, like a fully, fully powerful malware analysis on the endpoint. Uh, it's just uh, enough to be able to triage the file and then bring it, and then we can do uh, proper malware analysis, you know, in a sandbox and these kind of things, right? So so uh, there are parses for VBA and zip files and things like that, but we don't want to go over the top um, in that too much. Well, at least, I mean, you, you, can, you can extend it. Um, all right, um, there's a few notes here about temp files. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but you can create a temp file. And when you create a temp file, then when the query ends, then it will delete the temp file. So it won't leave them behind. So, uh, so you can use, use that to create temporary files so that you can, uh, pro during the query execution, and then it will clean up after itself. But um, yeah, so let's, let's just quickly go on to the control structure. Um, we talked about for each before, and I said it's like the most useful kind of 
um, <clears throat> of plugin. And we talked about uh, having uh, the two parameters. There's the row parameter where you put a query there and the query parameter. And then for each row that is emitted from this parameter, then we run this second parameter. It turns out that you can also use uh, row, instead of having a query here, you can put anything that's utterable. So like a list or, uh, or you know, a, an array or something like that. And so, that, so that's also useful. Um, and then you can still run the query on it. And if you just have a list here, then this query basically gets this special value underscore value because there's no, there's no actual columns. Um, so, um, okay, cool. Um, then there is an if, if is um, quite uh, uh, useful and we use, we use it a lot. If is like an if statement. Basically we have a parameter called condition and this condition can be, you know, a query, or it can be something that's, you know, not a query. And, um, you know, and we can basically run different kinds of queries based on that. So, you know, here, um, any of the enrichment, I don't know, like uh, there's an enrichment one and you can see, you, you'll be able to see uh, us using if a lot of, uh, you know, in a lot of examples, yeah, I don't know about specifically, um, there's got to be a if somewhere. <clears throat> the file finder actually uses. Uh, yeah, so we've got an if here. See? So uh, if we selected the Yara rule, then we run this query that uses the Yara rule, right? Um, otherwise, there's an else. Uh, if there's an else, we run this other query. Uh, and this is using stored queries, so it doesn't have to uh, nest them too much. So, <clears throat> so if is, is a very useful plugin that we use it all the time for control, for conditional control. Uh, a switch is very similar. Uh, and then uh, a, switch, a switch basically has a bunch of queries. And then the first query that returns results, then, then uh, it stops after that. So uh, because uh, VQL, by the way, VQL uses keyword arguments for all the parameters. So you can't really have positional arguments. They're all keyword arguments. So it's sort of like taking inspiration from Python there. Um, but Python allows positional arguments, but uh, VQL has gone even a step uh, more than that. So for things that kind of need to have, you know, some kind of order, then uh, we just you just put any any name name in here it doesn't matter um, it basically uses them as positional arguments for now so a b c that's good enough right uh, chain is uh, similar to um, to a switch except that it does all of these queries together it just chains them so it does the first query then it does the second query then it does the third query and it the, all of the rows from these ones they all come out in, uh, in into the same thing. All right, so the last, the last um, uh, thing that I wanted to cover here is aggregate functions. Um, so, and uh, aggregate functions are actually pretty, uh, uh, let me just, before I do that, let me just check a um, uh, question. Uh, if I would like to have a column for process, oh yeah, we've done that. Can if be triggered from specific parameter chosen? Yeah, of course, right? I mean, this is what you're seeing here. Um, uh, there is a, uh, you, you can see uh, there is a condition. If the condition is true, uh, then uh, you can, um, you know, if someone provided this the parameter more recent then, uh, then it will be true. Then we do this, right? So it, it doesn't matter what this condition is. It can be uh, anything. As long as um, you know it evaluates to true, then uh, then uh, then we use it. So if you use a bool parameter here, for example, so even here, upload whoop, upload file. You see here we have a condition: upload file and not is there. So if it's not a directory and the user selected upload file, then we upload it. 
right? So that's that. Uh, there's two two versions of the if uh, plugin uh, of if. One is a plugin, and one is a function. So the plugin uh, version. Remember the difference between a plugin and a function is a plugin returns lots of rows, and a function returns just the the one. Uh, just takes one uh, value and returns one value. So, um, <clears throat> okay, cool. So let's go, uh, let's get to aggregate uh, functions. So uh, aggregate functions are uh, basically functions that have state. So that means that normally when we run a, a VQL function, it doesn't really have any state. So it operates on each row in turn. So for example, if I did something like, um, I don't know, PS list, again, we'll do this example here. Uh, I can do something like format, right? format is a function. It's just a normal function, right? Uh, you know, which I can use something like this, args, and then provide two arguments, maybe the name and, you know, the P. So this is an example of a function that, you know, it just creates a kind of a format, right? So it, it gives it two parameters and it runs this thing. But the way it works is that every row, so this PS list again, returns rows, it generates rows and each row comes out of there and it goes, you know, again, the life of a query thing, right? It goes into this and then this evaluates this row and then the next row and the next row. But format doesn't really have state between each call, right? Each call is separate. So we are calling uh, format multiple times and it doesn't really have an internal state. So it's not an aggregate function, but there are a bunch of other functions that have internal state, and they're, ag they're called aggregate functions because we use aggregate functions to aggregate or collect information across different multiple rows. So the, the best example uh, for that is count. So count is a function uh, that counts. In order to count, you have to keep state, right? Because you have to remember what was the number, you know, last time. So when you run this count function, every time you evaluate it, it remembers the number for next time. So it, uh, it essentially has its internal state. So when you run it like this, then you can see that the first time that you run it, it's one, and then the next time it's two and three and four and so on. So that uh, that state is kept inside the function, right? So that the function is keeping state. When the row is evaluated, uh, then it then it uh, returns. Now we might say um, where you know, if I do a where. Uh, name matches CMD, right? So that's going to filter out most of these rows. And the count starts with one and two, right? And this, and when we understand why that is, right? Again, because this is lazy, right? So the same thing that happened in the first, you know, last, last uh, session, we talked about lazy evaluation. And because this is still lazy, because VQL is still very lazy, right? So when we are filtering things out, then that count function is not evaluated. It's only ever evaluated when the row is, you know, actually uh, emitted, right? When the row is calculated, then we calculate the count. And the side effect of calculating is that we add one, right, each time. So, so this is why uh, here we're going to count one, two, three, uh, but only for, from the ones that are matching, right? <clears throat> We can do the other way as well if we wanted to, where count and right. So again, okay. So we can do it either way, right? Um, uh, but this is again, um, uh, again, it's it's to do with the uh, uh, lazy evaluation that we talked about yesterday, right? So you can do either either thing. But anyway, the the point is um, getting a little bit off track. <laughs> Uh, what I wanted to actually say is just that uh, this count has state, right? So each time you are uh, running it, it has state. So, um, so there's a whole bunch of aggregate functions. There's count, there's sum, there's enumerate, 
and and there's rates. So there's there's a couple of uh, ones, and we're probably going to add more, you know, in future. Um, so, but let's understand how that works. Uh, aggregate functions are often used. Uh, they don't always have to be used, but they're often used for post-processing and especially to do stacking. So I'm just going to show you um, that here. Um, so I think we had a hunt here that we did yesterday, right? So uh, did we do it? No, no, we didn't do it. Oh, we'll do a hunt real quick. Uh, what were we hunting for? Uh, task scheduler. Okay, cool. So. Uh, oh, actually, this was the hunt from yesterday. No, it was not. That's right. The hunt that we did in session one. I'll, I'm going to talk about that here. So, if you recall, in session one, we did the hunt across uh, 2,000 machines uh, to find uh, scheduled tasks, right? So, back then, I'm just going to switch to that other server right now. Uh, <clears throat> so, we had 2,000 machines, we collected all our scheduled tasks. And if you recall, we already kind of had a bit of a taste. And remember I said to you in, in the first one that we're gonna have a little bit of a taste as to how we're doing these post-processing across our machines. So we did our hunt and we got our results. And what we're doing here now, we can look uh, more carefully at how, uh, how these um, uh, VQL looks like. So again, we have a VQL plugin called Hunt Results. What that plugin does is it looks at the hunt. So it's a server-side plugin again. And all it can do is look at the results that are collected. They've already been collected from the hunt. So it just kind of like literally opens files, you know, on disk, and then it emits each row uh, into the query, right? So that row comes out. So we give it the hunt ID and, you know, the artifact that we want to um, look at. So this is the task scheduler one. And then essentially every single task, it's going to, from each host, from all the hosts, is going to, um, is going to emit them uh, as a row. So it comes out one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then in this example, what we're going to do is add a, a count function <clears throat> to, to the columns. So we'll probably also want to do a fully qualified FQTN. You'll see that every every client has its um, oh, I think it's like this. Every, there's a client name. That's the client name, and <clears throat> because the you know it's a hunt, right? So it, it has results from all the clients. So we need to know which client has you know what data in it, right? So so we 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 don't want to see all the all the columns. We just want to see these ones right now. But you can see that essentially every time this count is evaluated, that number goes up one, two, three, four. So this is the aggregate function, but there's going to be literally hundreds of thousands of rows in this hunt. It's a big hunt, 2000 machines, right? So what we really want to do is we want to um, only look at maybe certain files, right? So let's, let's start to filter. So in this case, we're going to look at um, all the commands that possibly match uh, cmd.exe because this is a task scheduler. Right? So a lot of the time, you know, malware wants to add, uh, a a, you know, persistence to a task scheduler and they might run some, you know, PowerShell or command prompt or some batch files or whatever to, to install themselves. So for this example, we're going to assume um, uh, that, um, yeah, that we've got cmd.exe off we go. And we are only going to look at 50 for now. So you can see immediately we are filtering out, you know, these, these rows, right? So filtering them out. So again, the, there's nothing really magical here because the count is just going up by one for each one, but that's because count, the function count has its internal state, right? But the magic really happens when we group by. So I'm going to just do this group by and group by, what group? What does group by do? Um, what we're telling group by is we're telling it to do a combination. So in this case, we're going to look at command and arguments together, arguments together, right? So the combination of command and arguments. So this is an expression, right? It's going to take 
both of those columns. So I'm going to put them together. And uh, for each of those, when, I, when they're unique, the unique value, it's going to make a group out of it because that's what group by does. You know, it makes groups. And what does that mean when you make a group? So when you make a group, you take all the rows that have the same values for these, right, for this expression, and you put them together in one group. And the way that it works is that this group uh, uh, basically creates a state for aggregate functions. So all the aggregate functions are going to use uh, the same state in, in that group. But in the other group, they're using a different state. Uh, does that make sense? So if we are running this, um, uh, what does it actually do is it does exactly what you expect you know, that it would do. It basically just counts all the items that are the same. But the way that it works is, um, uh, I'll just let that run because I have a slightly smaller example in the slides. I have a picture here to explain uh, what does group by exactly do. So this is the example here that I've got, right? So what the group by does is if you have a table, <clears throat> right? So let's say X and Y, and you say group by X, right? So what it means is it takes all the columns, all the, all the rows that have X the same, right? So this one has X the same, and this one has X the same, and it puts it into a bean. So all of these, they go into one bean, right? And then all the other ones that go into the other bean. So, so we end up with essentially beans. This bean has these rows in it, and this bean has that row in it. So it's like a big group. So this is the group, right? And then the count, the, uh, the count is, uh, it basically looks at all the rows you know, in that bean. But the way that it works is that the aggregate function has its own state, but the state is per bean, right? So each, so this, this is one state and that is one state. So that's why uh, it works, right? So, so when we count, uh, then you see that it ends up that this is a group. It's this one row is a group because that's what group by does. So that's one group. And then that is another group. And then the state of, uh, the, all the aggregate functions in that group is, you know, there's one state. So whenever we evaluate count inside of this group, then uh, it adds the count to that group only, right? Not to, uh, not to the other groups. And that's kind of how it works. I'll show you another example that will make it much, much clearer. But, <clears throat> but essentially, it does what we want to do in terms of stacking, right? To find the unique groups and count how many items are in each group. But, um, but it works by this you know, enumeration, right? So, uh, so let's, let's have a look at another example. And this is a very useful uh, tool uh, when you want to count all the rows just as, a, as just a big count, right? Uh, and you don't really want to create the groups, you don't, like in that case, uh, you, can also do, you can always do a group by one. Or, or any other constant really, it doesn't matter. Uh, because what actually happens is that this expression evaluates to the same value all the time. So it ends up just creating one bin, right? And then it just counts all the items in that bin. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to know all the, um, what was it? Let's go back to here. If we wanted to know all the, how many processes uh, all up, then we can just do a, um, so here we could just do like group, group by uh, commands, uh, group by name. And that would show us a count of how many instances, you know, for each process, right? Um, you know, so then we can do order, by count descending, right? And that will show us, you know, oh, we've got SVC host 70 of those, right? So, so we can do this counting per group. But if we just want to know how many processes all up, then if we just do a group by one, then 
it just tells us all the processes, right? 150 straight up, right? Because it creates one group of all the processes. So that's, that is actually a, uh, a useful uh, tool that we, we actually use that uh, in a number of queries. Um, and finally, I have this example here. Um, I'll just show you this example uses a number of different, um, can you order by alphabetically? Yeah, I mean, we just, we just did that uh, order by. Um, yeah, we order by account or, or whatever, or name or whatever. Yeah, so order by is um, you know, sorts it, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I have an example here. Uh, so what we have here is uh, a CSV file, essentially. We have an X and a Y heading header, and then we have just some numbers here. And what I'm showing you uh, here is I'm just parsing that CSV file so that just to get some data to, to work with. Uh, and I'm showing you some of the uh, common um, uh, common um, uh, enumer enumeration uh, aggregate functions. So count we've seen, enumerate, is basically it this one it aggregates uh, all the aggregates all the all the rows in the group it just copies them into a big list right so you end up with like a big list so for example you see that in this case we're grouping by x so we're going to have one group that has this this you know that's the one the, the all the ones they go in this group right the two goes in this group there's going to be two of those and there's a five, right? So one contains two, uh, two rows, two items, and these are them. So enumerate just kind of collects them together and sum adds them up, right? So, and then uh, this guy, uh, two, there's two rows in here, right? And, uh, and it comes here. Now it's actually important to realize that the value of Y here is, kind of random don't rely on it when you're doing a group by it sort of doesn't make any sense to uh to collect other columns that are not part of the group because uh what happens is i mean essentially the um the value that will end up uh taking uh, the y y value is the last row that goes into the group right so and that's kind of a random number, a random value. It's one of the random rows that ends up going into the group. So you, it's not very reliable and you can't really use it. It's not useful. Right? So, so it's not a good practice to rely on a column in a group by that is not part of the group, right? But I mean, that's the same in SQL. It's, it's the, same, the same problem. <clears throat> okay, cool. So uh, yeah, so that's the group by. Uh, I have a whole bunch of stuff here about events. I was hoping to, uh, can you filter the Y column? Yeah, so you, you can. Yeah, you can filter by the Y column in this case um, if, if, if that's what you wanted. And then, then the filter will apply first and then the group by and then the order by. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I did wanted to uh, cover some of the event queries, um, but... Um, Maybe we have like five minutes. Yeah, let's do it. It's, it's, it. This one is a very quick exercise, only, only takes about five minutes. So uh, I'm just gonna really introduce event queries because they are, um, uh, it's because this is a VQL thing, but we're gonna do them a bit later on uh, in more details. <clears throat> so uh, basically we talked about VQL and we said VQL was asynchronous. Uh, so it basically, you don't have to wait for the whole result set to come back. Uh, essentially, as soon as uh, data is available, it becomes available, right? So uh, remember we talked about visualizing how the rows move through the query. We talked about the life, uh, life of a query. Uh, you, know, you can see the rows going uh, you know, through the query, right? So, the, uh, so then it occurred to me like, okay, what if we had a plugin that uh, never terminated. So if the plugin doesn't terminate, it just continues to send rows to the query, right? Uh, and as soon as the rows are sent, you know they're going to go through the query and get processed. But uh, but essentially, uh, we're going to go back and listening to uh, you know watch watch for new rows to appear as well. 
And when you think about it, uh, that creates uh, something called an event, event queries. So if, for example, our plugin uh, will release a row for each event, then, uh, then it uh, basically becomes uh, a way of monitoring or creating a monitoring um, type setup. So let's have a look at uh, how that works in reality. So we have a VQL plugin over here, and let's say that that plugin, it just uh, it, it's like it just waits, right? It doesn't do anything. It just sits there and waiting, looking for an event of some sort. An event will going to happen, uh, and then uh, whenever an event occurs, uh, a row is released uh, into the query. So it goes into the query, and then you know the query can filter it, can have a where close or whatever. And, uh, and then it batches those rows a little bit, and then it sends them to the, to the server uh, a little bit. So in a partial result set. So it sends small result set along the way. So here's an exercise. We're gonna do that real quick. Um, okay, so we're gonna do this very simple, right? Select star from clock. So, uh oh not that one, clock. So clock is a very simple plugin. Uh, and it's an e the simplest event plugin. So if we can uh, just run that, and you'll see that what happens is when I run it, it looks like it's very slow, right? It looks like it's taking some time and, uh, and it's releasing, it's still running and it's gonna release nine rows in nine seconds and so on, right? So basically what happens is it's releasing rows and it doesn't stop and it will never actually stop, right? We can press stop to stop it. But what, hap what happens is that if you look at the, this, um, the columns that come back, these are all the columns of, of the time, time format. Remember I mentioned before uh, the time.time, .time. we have the, the timestamp. And this essentially every second, this clock plugin is returning one row. And you can see that this thing is just kind of, you know, it's it's running um, in the UI, in the UI. It's just waiting for this to happen. So it's actually no different than if the plugin was just extremely slow and it just took forever to actually do anything. And this it released uh, rows as it went along, and we're getting partial result sets as it goes along. Right. So essentially, that is that is what an event uh, query is, um, and it's very simple to see, right? If we select Unix, we'll get a, a timestamp. So this is just one of the columns, uh, which just gives us a Unix timestamp, right? And, um, and we will see, you know, the same kind of thing happening, right? Um, every few seconds, it will, uh, <clears throat> every second it releases one row. So 51, 52, 53, 54, right? So, uh, that that is an event query, right? Now we can build an entire monitoring architecture around this uh, this concept, because those event queries can run uh, indefinitely. Uh, uh, can we is a question? Can we calculate the performance of the command consumption against machine resource? Uh, yes. So as you can see, uh, I think I've covered it uh, the other day in the first. Uh, thing is that we are always collecting telemetry from the endpoint. So, um, so we know how much CPU loads, you know, that we're using uh, as, but as an aggregate. So we kind of, of course, break it down to a query, but we know the process, right? Like how much memory and CPU usage the process is using all up. So we, we do keep monitoring uh, that. So when you run a query, then you should be able to see, you know, some impact on it or whatever, right? Uh, but it's usually not very big, right? So, you know, <clears throat> is there a way to limit it? Yes, so we can we can do these uh, resource limits. We're gonna talk about them later. Uh, essentially, uh, when you do a collection, you can, uh, you can control the, um, you know, any of those. There's a specify resources here and you can control how fast they run it on the endpoints, you know, how long for and these kind of things. When can we, okay. When can we get the video from yesterday? Uh, hopefully we can get this uh, later on, uh, maybe tomorrow, um, we have to edit it still. Cool, okay. Um, so client monitoring architecture. Uh, yeah, so basically inside the client, we have a whole bunch of event queries that run in parallel. 
And uh, when any of those produce rows, the client streams them to the server, right? So here's the client. It's going to run here. And here we have these event queries. So there's just VQL queries like anything else. Uh, and then they just, just run along. And um, they actually can even run when it's, the client is offline. There is a local client buffer file. And, uh, and then we take that file. In that file, we queue up all the messages. So even when we are offline, the, the messages are getting queued here. And we come, when we come back online, then we just stream it off to the server. Right? So, so these are the results. Um, so here's an example. Fair, I'm just going to show you real quick an example of how that works. Uh, so the UI for it is down here, client events. That is the UI for uh, managing and viewing uh, event, event queries on the clients. And the way it works is that if I press the binoculars, I will be able to see the current, the current monitoring table. So that's the current uh, event queries that are configured for each client right now. So you can see that it's broken by, uh, so there's just, it's just artifacts. So again, artifacts are just a way of um, um, wrapping or encapsulating the VQL query. So I'm just gonna add another one here. Um, and we, in, in, uh, in, with client monitoring, we can target groups based on labels. So I'm just going to cho choose the all, the all label. Um, uh, oh, and this, this is an example of one that I did before. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll add another one now. So <clears throat> one, one that I like to use is a DNS one as well. Uh, DNS. Uh, oh no, that's the server. I want the client. Uh, this one is for the client. So this is a DNS monitoring uh, type uh, artifact. <clears throat> Sorry, the ETW one is better. What it does is it uses the event tracing for Windows to essentially intercept all the DNS um, calls from the endpoint and report on them. So all I have to do is just select it. I can configure uh, this so that it's the same thing. It looks the same. Uh, the UI is very similar to the client, uh, to the normal collection UI, except that what I'm doing here is I'm adding those artifacts to the event table. So they're actually, um, so once I add them to the event table, they're gonna be synced to all the clients and all the clients will start to run those queries permanently and, uh, you know, and, and monitor for those, you know, for those events. So when I, when I do that, um, you know, the client will sync, sync it and, um, <clears throat> sorry, I've added the ETW DNS. Now it's going to take some minutes for this to uh, kind of get uh, cached, uh, to get batched because the events are happening, you know, uh, all the time and they'll just get batched. So I'm just going to generate some DNS traffic here. I don't know, like um, YouTube, maybe, I don't know. We'll just generate some DNS stuff. Um, just normal browsing activity. And the client is actually collecting uh, this, uh, this information right now. Uh, what if the client did not receive the collection query? Well, then it, it wouldn't be updated, right? But it's, so the way it works is that, uh, I mean, obviously they're always connected, so it will always work. Uh, if it's not connected or it's not online right now, then when it comes back and checks again, then it will realize that its uh, event table is out of out of sync with the server, and it will refresh and it will resync itself. Right? So, so there is like a versioning type thing. You can see the logs. So the logs show us um, essentially when the query started on the endpoint. So um, the logs are telling us that the query is running on the endpoint, uh, and it also gives us like a bit of a heartbeat every you know five minutes, um, <clears throat> but. You know, eventually, uh, it's, I think it takes a couple of minutes because it, we try and batch it. I mean, we get the event immediately, but we actually try and batch it so it doesn't, um, so we don't, you know, uh, send too frequently uh, messages, right? So uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. We should have some something there. Now, over here, we have another uh, example here. This one looks at... Um, uh, this is a query that I was working on. I, I will probably do that as a quiz a bit later on. Um, but it, it detects hashes in the downloads directory when they when they uh, appear. Uh, quick question. What if the client... Oh, yeah. No, we've done that. Uh, okay. 
Cool. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll just, uh, we'll come back to that. Oh yeah, here we go. So now we've got some DNS stuff, right? Here we go. So you can see that uh, the DNS queries that we are monitoring have started to, uh, you know, come in. Uh, and this just happens like totally automatic, automatically. You don't really have to kind of worry about it or think about it. It just feeds the DNS uh, back, um, uh, back to, um, to the server. Uh, so that's event queries. We're going to do a lot of interesting stuff with event queries. This particular event query in the slides, it's watching the event log for uh, events. Um, and it's an event query, which will basically, as soon as the event appears on the event log, then it will generate an event and re respond to it. Uh, can you select two froms at the same time? Um, what does that mean to select two froms at the same time? Um, I guess, whoops. Um, whoops. Uh, I, I guess you meant like a, a join or something like that. Then we, we can use the for each plugin to, to do that. Uh, otherwise you can do a chain, which you can select one query uh, from something and then the other query from something. And then you get the two sets of uh, rows uh, combined in one table. Cool, all right, so let me just uh, quickly go through the conclusions. Uh, okay, so this, this module was over two sessions because it's quite a large one. And we had, uh, we looked at um, uh, VQL at a lot of details. Um, and uh, some of it was quite technical, but you saw that it was actually really important uh, and it comes out, you know, quite often, uh, you know, these kind of subtlety, but I guess the best thing for you guys is to just try and visualize how the row, how the rows flow through the query. Um, we learned about stored queries and uh, we learned about being lazy and the control structures, um, you know, and um, yeah. So basically now armed with this knowledge of VQL uh, in the next module, we're gonna be able to use that to write uh, more forensic detections and, uh, and actually, we'll, we're going to learn about how to employ that. Uh, uh, and we're going to look at some of the forensic capabilities in, uh, in Velociraptor. And again, VQL just kind of like puts those together in an unusual way. But um, now we can, you know, we can, we can uh, be more, more proactive. Uh, okay, one question. If I create multiple client event artifacts using the same watch plugin, will they share the same pipe trace? That's an excellent point. Yes, yes. Uh, generally, generally, yes, that's true. Um, so if you are watching, for example, a, a particular uh, event source, like you know the event log, then all of the queries will actually receive the same events, right? Uh, but this is kind of an optimization in the binary, uh, in Velociraptor the, to kind of, so we don't have to pass the same you know, thing multiple times. So yes, it's done efficiently to try and share share that together. Um, okay, another question. Will DOH or TLS 1.3 affect the results of the DNS artifact if enabled in the browser? Um, it's a good question. I don't think so because the DNS artifact is using the event tracing for Windows. So it's actually designed for this very purpose, right? So unless, so again, um, I must say that it, the software has to obviously support that. So if you're using something like Edge or something like a Microsoft product, then it would be a, a generating those ETW um, events because that's kind of what it's supposed to do. Of course, you know, if you're using a custom software that does its own DNS lookups, that doesn't use the system DNS, you know, then uh, it's entirely possible that you won't see that with ETW, of course, but, uh, yeah, generally speaking, like, you know, the difference, you know, there's another ETW source for parsing URLs. And uh, to give you an example, an edge, you know, even the new Microsoft Edge does generate those URLs uh, in the ETW. So we can listen to all the URLs as they are being um, uh, used if the user is using Edge. But if they're using Chrome, then we can't see that because they don't generate those events. So Microsoft tends to always you know, generate DTW events, but that's not necessarily always the case. Um, 
will we be able to uh, pause AM cache and shim cache? Yeah, I mean, we're going to look at that in the, in the forensic artifacts. Um, so in another two sessions, uh, session two. Cool. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that's that's it for today. Um, so hopefully we'll have the recording up um, soon or maybe in a few hours. Uh, and what I'll do is I'm, I'm going to try and get also the recording for uh, yesterday and add it to the video links uh, over here. Um, cool. And I'll see you guys tomorrow, same time. I'm just going to stop the recording. Stop.